Hey, Foundry. Martin, it's been a while, and uh, I got to apologize right off the bat. If you were hoping to see Adam today, you're going to have to uh, feel like you're maybe a little bit let down. But since a lot of what I'm about to talk about is uh, resetting expectations, I hope that you can manage it. We'll just keep on going, and you can talk to him when he's back from warm Tennessee and tell him that you missed him desperately and you had to deal with me. But until then... I think expectations is kind of the word of the day in my mind. It's something that rolls around this time of year for me a lot because it's a time of expectations. Uh, We have them, I have them, we all have them. You have expectations that you set around everything that's going on from I saw the snow flying and I was sure it was going to be a snow day to the fact that I knew grandma was going to make her famous pie on Christmas Day. We just get in this mindset of we've seen these traditions year after year come around the Christmas season and we set our expectations based on what we want to see and we can sometimes get ourselves so worked up and then the smallest thing comes along and changes them and it can completely throw us for a loop. Uh, For me, sometimes this is really easy, and my wife will get all excited about seeing the family and doing the things, and all of a sudden, somebody will get sick, and that seems like it's all too prevalent this year. Somebody in the family gets sick, and all of a sudden, all the plans that were set, all the food that was bought, it goes away. And now what are we going to do? When are we going to get together? It throws chaos and we get stressed out and that can be a really, really chaotic time. So if your parents are in that place, I'm going to ask you to show them a little bit of grace. But for you as well and me, maybe it's something a little bit simpler. Maybe it's the expectations that we set around what's going to be under the Christmas tree on Christmas morning. I mean, this one might be the most stereotypical expectation out there, but for me, it's still true. I can get my mind set on something and be really, really excited about it. And if it doesn't meet those expectations perfectly, man, I fall right off. And a few years ago, my wife did something so over the top and amazing. She bought me a sword. We all know I'm a child, so don't get too excited about this. But it was an amazing, really nice samurai sword. Don't ask me why an adult man needs a samurai sword, but everybody should have one. Only I had an expectation that it was going to be kind of shorter and it was going to be something I could carry with me on my backpack because, again, that's a normal thing in my head. And it didn't quite fit. And it threw me. And she didn't see that excitement in my face because I was too busy being dead set on what I thought I wanted. Sometimes the expectations can be a lot more important. Maybe they're that, you know, we're going to see a certain part of our family on Christmas and uh, they don't show up. Or maybe it's just that maybe our family is going to be sane this year at Christmas. And frankly, I don't know about you, but that's rare in my world. But whatever it is, we get ourselves really tuned in. And I remember one Christmas very specifically, and it wasn't even my expectations that got me. But uh, that Christmas, I think I was probably somewhere between 12 and 14 years old. I'm really bad with memory, but I remember being so excited because I thought that year I was going to get this really cool sled. Now, I'm picturing like a go down the hill plastic sled. I think it had brakes on it. Like I was just stoked about it because there's a cool sledding hill nearby. And I remember waking up that morning, coming out and looking under the tree, and there was certainly nothing that looked like a sled. So immediately my expectations are unmet and I I start kind of getting in that mood. But as I'm opening presents, I get to this one and it's a massive box and it probably couldn't fit a sled, but it was really, really big. And I opened it up and I ripped it and there was another box inside, fully wrapped. I'm like, all right, okay, open it up. I don't know if your parents have played this trick on you yet, but I'm going to ruin it for them if they do because there's about 10 more boxes and I'm shredding through these things and I'm so excited about what's maybe in there, and I get down to the bottom, and it's a box about this big. And I'm absolutely baffled on what would be worth that much wrapping paper that could be in a box this big. But when I opened it up, I almost lost my mind because it was a sled. It just wasn't a plastic sled. It was a key. And I ran outside. Now, I wasn't 16, so I knew it wasn't a car. So I got outside, and there it is. I owned a snowmobile. Now, Mind you, this is a 1972 snowmobile, flat front, bogey wheels, did like a max speed of 20 miles an hour, I think. But I had a snowmobile, and I jumped on it, and before I could get out of the driveway, my mom yelled out, and she threw me another gift, and it was the helmet, so I threw it on. I think I'm in shorts and a t-shirt at this point, and down the road I go at max speed. Again, 20 miles an hour or so. But when I got back to the house, and I finally put it down, my fingers are numb, and I just came in, and I had the biggest smile on my face. 
I remember the words my mom said to me. She said, I wish it could have been more. And it sucked all of the excitement right out of me. Somehow I felt this turmoil of guilt and like, should I, do I, did I make you feel like it wasn't enough? What did I do wrong? Like, I, there was all this stuff. And I realized she had an expectation. See, her expectation was, I, I don't know if my, it could have been about my reaction because I don't think I could have done anything other than maybe a backflip to show how much more excited I was. But the expectation that was set was something that when she thought she didn't meet it, it ruined everything. And I realized that day that expectations, almost always, expectations tarnish reality. They just put this dingy film around it. We, we get to whatever it is. You know, we open that gift on Christmas morning. We see the people that did show up. Maybe it's just the fact that our family is there, but they're not maybe in as good a mood as we'd hoped. But we had an expectation, and, and that tarnishes the reality of it that otherwise we could have enjoyed. Man, I could have enjoyed that snowmobile for months, and I think I did. I ran that thing into the ground over the course of the next couple of years. But I remember that morning, all of the excitement and thrill and fun was tarnished by that idea that, man, it should have been more. And as I was thinking about that and remembering that story, I realized that this is very much what happened when we first met this character in scripture named Jesus. See, we read the, the Christmas story a lot of years on Luke, and it's in Luke chapter 2. So if, if you haven't gotten there yet and uh, your family wants to read this together, Luke chapter 2, and you can read it, and it'll tell you all about the census and, and all of the things that happened as, as Jesus is born and swaddled in a manger and the shepherds come and the wise men present gifts, and it's a story that many of us know, and it's beautiful. But we oftentimes forget to put it in context. We forget what happened just before it. And even in Luke chapter 1, we get a hint of this. In Luke chapter 1, in verse 68, it starts out by saying, Blessed is the Lord, the God of Israel, because he has visited and provided redemption for his people. He has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Just as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets in ancient times, salvation from our enemies and from the hand of those who hate us. See, there was this expectation set by the prophecies, and these were God's prophecies. There was nothing bad about this, but it set up an idea in the people of Israel's mind of what they were going to get. And we see this in other scriptures, like Isaiah 53, that tells us all about this, this person that's going to come, the Messiah that's going to come and save Israel. But we have to remember that at that time, Israel was captive. That means they had been enslaved by the nation of Babylon or nation of Rome, and they're living in captivity at this point, and they're basically under the thumb of a foreign ruler. They can barely practice their own religion. So their expectation is that God is going to provide them a Messiah, and he's going to be this king warrior that's going to save them, that there's going to be a great war, and he's just going to destroy the enemies, and he's going to bring them back. And you can see that from that scripture where they would get this idea. But what they really get is a baby that, as Britain said last week, had to be burped and changed. They got a suffering servant, a man that would give himself away for us. It wasn't what they expected. And, and we see over the course of all the Gospels, all of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that as Jesus is proclaiming his ministry, as he's doing what he's meant to do, he's healing people, he's creating miracles, he's, he is living his ministry out on earth, that people are disappointed, that there is an expectation that he didn't meet, that he would somehow wipe out the Roman Empire and they'd be free right then, but Jesus never came to free them from Rome, he came to free us from sin. Jesus' job was so much bigger it was more than we could have ever expected, but when the expectations were set for him to be something, the baby in the manger didn't seem like enough. And we do this too. I do this all the time. We talked about some of the petty expectations, but sometimes we do the same thing to God. We put our expectations on God that if God would blank, then I would. And, and my, my atheist friends out there, I love you to death. I'm so glad that you're out there. But I hear you say this statement all the time. If God would just perform a miracle, then I would believe. 
But like this whole first part of the Bible proves that that's not the case. God was doing miracles all the time and people still chose to look away. It's no different for us today. God performs plenty of miracles. I, I've seen them myself. People healed miraculously. Families brought back together. He's still doing everything he's ever done. But we say that all the time. If God would blank, then I would. If God would just tell me to, then I'd quit that specific sin. If, if God would make it easier, then I would. And sometimes we set those same expectations on ourselves. If I were just a little bit better, then God could fully love me. Well, we don't understand the gospel when we say those things because God has no expectations of us. He made us out of dust. As my friend Heidi Burgess often says, God has very low expectations of dust. But those expectations, they tarnish reality. So what do we do? What do we learn from this story in Luke chapter 2? about how to reset those expectations. Well, I see that there are these five characters in Luke chapter two. The angels, Mary, the shepherds, some guy named Simon, and some woman named Anna. They're both prophets or prophetesses. We don't have to get into that, but every one of them has a very unique response to the, the fact that Jesus was born, this baby in a manger. They either praise God, they treasure this Re, or this uh, expectation, or they treasure this experience in their heart, or they glorify God. The angels, there's a host of angels that glorifies God and praises him for the birth of this baby. Mary treasures it in his, her heart. Simon proclaims the truth and then realizes and praises God, and Anna praises God as well. We see the shepherds and the wise men as well. And when I realize that they praise, they treasure, and they glorify, I realize that those all fall under one word. They show gratitude. They choose gratitude. They see this baby born, and they know that that means that they're not going to be free from Rome today. But they choose to believe what they know to be promised by God's word, something we get that choice as well. And what do they do? They choose gratitude. They choose to praise, to worship, and to be thankful for Jesus being born. See, replacing expectations with gratitude allows us to truly appreciate a gift. And this can be in the little things too. So when you wake up on Christmas morning and you get the pajamas, you can choose gratitude in that moment and to be grateful for that. We can choose to be grateful for the people in our lives on Christmas morning, even though they're broken and they're far from perfect. We hope that they choose gratitude when they see that in us, don't we? But most of all, and with all importance, we can choose to be grateful this Christmas season for a savior that did come down to earth, that was born in a manger, that chose to live his life out as a suffering servant, for you and for me, that he gave his life so that we wouldn't be trapped by the sin that has kept us. We can be grateful for all that he has done and we can choose gratitude in a way that allows us to relate to him in a way where we just put our hands up and say, thank you, Lord, for what I have today. May I continue to follow you no matter what I have tomorrow. It's a powerful thing, gratitude. Way back in Psalms, the author writes this, let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. This Christmas season, if we believe what we say we believe and our Savior was born, let us enter his presence with thanksgiving. Let us show gratitude by saying thank you to our Savior for what he's done and asking him, to show us what we can be grateful for tomorrow. Man, I am so grateful that you guys tuned in and spent these few minutes with us. I pray that you have an amazing Christmas and that over the course of it, you don't have to pretend gratitude, but you can practice it and you can choose it. And I pray that you are impacted by the birth of that little baby thousands of years ago, the same way that I have. I love you, praying for you. Have an amazing Christmas.